So we're going to be introducing, bear with me, because uh, I'm going to introduce another panel, and uh, hopefully this goes a bit better than last time. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Uh, it's going to be called Douglas Adams, The Man and His Galaxy. It will be chaired by Dick Fiddy with Dirk Mags, John Lloyd, and James Thrift. Right. Can we have you on stage, please? <laughs> They're toying with me. <laughs> <laughs> we never know what's on it, do you? Is this one working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Hello. Well, I think it's very fitting we're here in the British Library because um, I'm a, a huge fan of The Hitchhikers, especially the book, actually. And um, I think it's, a, it's got an idiosyncratic comic style, which I think is similar to his great hero, P.G. Woodhouse, but it has a voice like Damon Runyon's work, and I'd say like Spike Milligan in works like Pacoon. So I think it's very fitting that we're celebrating his career and his life here. I never knew Douglas Adams, although I've, I often think that I do know a bit about him because of, of the work, and because of what I've read into it. But of course, you three knew him very well, and I'd like to see if I can learn a bit about him and his galaxy from you three. So can we start off with, this is James, who's um, Douglas Adams' half-brother, I think that's right, isn't it? Yep. Yep. And uh, you must have, uh, you must have uh, known him having the demons as he struggled to get this story out of him. Can you remember, recall any of those times? Um, I, I mean, most of our growing up, I can just remember pissing him off an awful lot. <laughs> um, he... Um, yeah, he used to, everything with Douglas was, was manic. He was, everything was conducted at a, at a hell of a pace. Um, and it always used to be where uh, he, his bedroom was down the corridor. Um, and the walls in between all our rooms were basically where his room was quite thin. And so all you would hear, uh, basically, was this frantic, frantic typing. He would, this, and those typewriters, you see there's a few of them online and around, which he's sort of people, either he's, I don't think he ever signed them, but other people probably signed them. And you'd hear this frantic, absolutely frantic, of him typing on typewriter, and then slanging the carriage across, and then typing and typing. And then it would go quiet for a while. Uh, and then you would hear things being thrown at rubbish bins and that, <laughs> and that guttural scream that I think is quite new. And, and then he just sort of disappeared into the bathroom for a while. Um, and uh, during this period, we would all just sit in the house just being very, very quiet, not knowing quite what was going on, whether this was a good moment. For, invariably, though, they were all utterly bad moments. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it was quite... It was, at the time, we really weren't sure what was actually the cause of all this because, you know, this is before before anyone knew about Hitchhikers. Uh, to us, basically, the big deal was the fact that he was a scriptwriter for, for, um, uh, for Doctor Who. Uh, and so, I mean, that was cool, having a brother who basically worked on Doctor Who, you know, that was cool. Um, Hitchhikers, I mean, John would have known more about them than the whole Hitchhikers at that point, because uh, long before I ever met the man, uh, basically the phone would ring in our house and it would always be for Douglas, and it would either have been it would jo two Johns. It was either John Lloyd or John Cantor. Um, and so invariably you cry, you know, it's John, and the, which one? <laughs> so, yeah, that brings us neatly to John, who is uh, instrumentally involved uh, both with the radio series and in bringing the radio series to television eventually. But can you tell us how you first became involved with Douglas Adams and first learned about the story? Uh, well, as you know, Dick, the whole thing's a disaster for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah... I knew Douglas slightly at, uh, at university. He, had, he was in the next college. And um, uh, we were kind of rivals because he ran the St. John's Review group, uh, Adam Smith Adams, and I ran the Trinity Review. So, you know, we were kind of friendly rivals, as it were, but we became very good friends after we came down. And we were as good a friend as you could possibly be for several years before he became immensely rich and famous. And um, <laughs> we shared a flat and then a house together in Roehampton. And, um, and Douglas struggled, you know, through his whole life in many ways. But he was the most amazing companion and, and friend. I mean, funny and always fascinating and completely mad. And, 
uh, and a delight in every way. But um, one day I came back to this weird house we had in Roehampton. It was a furnished house. And for some reason, Douglas's room had seven wardrobes in it, <laughs> six of which were locked. <laughs> and, uh, and this is where one of this is the place where he got the idea for the captain the bee arc because he'd basically stay all day in the bath drinking cups of tea while I worked as a radio producer and came home and then we'd write in the evenings and I came home one night and he was sitting on on his bed there was only one bed in the room strangely um, with his head in his hands and he said Johnny I'm I've got to give this up I'm going to become a shipbroker in Hong Kong because I'm not cutting it as a writer anymore, and he was really tearful about it. Um, he was going to do the shipbroking thing because Jeffrey Perkins had done that for a couple of years beforehand, and he, he, he'd enjoyed it very much. Anyway, the very next week, he got the commission for the pilot of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and the rest is history. It just shows you, on a sixpence, the world turned. So anybody who's ever found that they're in despair and, uh, and that nothing's working for them, just stick with it a few days longer. <laughs> and it might come good for you. That's my philosophical thought for the day. I mean, basically, someday the weather will break, always. And it broke for Douglas. And of course, if you can get over that hillock, that speed bump, it can completely transform your life. And you were very, I mean, did, you, did he tell you much about the story? Did you discuss it with him? Did you work on it together? I mean, how did you, you became in, intrinsically involved in the series, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, he, he as famously was was very slow as a writer um, and would agonize for you know with the books for example he spent 10 months of his year's deadline on the first paragraph <laughs> <laughs> enormous waste paper baskets fill the house you know uh, and then and write the whole rest of it in three weeks on a plane to Singapore or something crazy um, but uh, so I didn't know much about what was going on I just thought when you've I've invented a few good titles in my life, and that is the greatest title, I think. You know, you just immediately have to pick up the book, don't you? You wonder what it's about and all that. And um, so that's really all I knew. And about sort of four and a half episodes into the first series, he got stuck, and he said, Johnny, will you, will you help me out? And I said, of course. So, and I gave him, as some of you may know, some hitchhiker fans. I, had, I was trying to write a, a science fiction book myself. It's called Gigax. And so I gave him this unfinished Actually, I read some of it recently. It was absolutely terrible. Um, I gave it to him and said, use anything you like. And then we sat down. And whereas the first four and a half episodes had taken him nine or ten months to write, the last two took us three weeks. It was amazing fun. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of my life being the sort of comedy cleaning lady. You know, I worked with Peter Cook and, you know, Graham Chapman and people who are mad, Douglas, all mad geniuses and very disorganized, and I'm an organized, tidy upper person, so I, you know, I plump up their cushions for them and, you know, clean the sausage rolls from out and under the sofa and all that kind of thing. And that's what I was, so I'm an enabler, so I helped Douglas. It was really good fun, very enjoyable, and it contains, of course, some of the most iconic things in the series, including the number 42, which I remember sitting in, in our flat uh, t talking about that. Um, so I didn't know much, so I picked it up from a standing start. And it was really just helping him put order on his genius, because the genius was always there. Um, it's just that sometimes he, he couldn't see which bits were good and which weren't good, and that was my, my job as a kind of script editor, really. And then I, um, when I went to telly, I, um, I did Not the Nine O'Clock News for a couple of series, and it did quite well. And I went to my head of department, John Howard Davis, who was a genius, who had um, been the first producer of Monty Python, as some of you may know, produced all of Forty Towers, produced Reggie Perrin, and numerous other things. Absolute genius, very nice guy. And I said, John, I, there's this radio series called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And he goes, that's a weird title. What's that? I said, well, it's a kind of science fiction comedy thing. He said, science fiction comedy, is that, is that a thing? I said. <laughs> Well, it is now. Um, he said, well, it sounds very intriguing. Should we commission a pilot script, do you think? And I said, yes. <laughs> and that was how BBC commissioning used to work. I was in there, I think it was 18 and a half seconds. So th that's how the series came to be. But then uh, the BBC has always been a bit crackers because they then said, well, you obviously can't produce it. 
because if you produce two successful series in a row, you'll have an impossibly big head and you're only 27 and we're all gonna hate you. <laughs> so they gave it to this bloke called Alan J.W. Bell, uh, who didn't like science fiction and certainly didn't like Douglas. And so it was all a bit sticky for that series. And, uh, and I was thinking, what, what I often said is that it was literally translated, because Alan's big hit before being last of the summer wine, you know, which is very similar to Hitchhiker's Guides of the Galaxy in all sorts of ways. The, uh, and he didn't really get it, and so he tried to do everything literally. So Zaphod Beeblebrox is said to have two heads, as we all know, and three arms. So he had a sort of rubbery, you know, CGI didn't exist in those days, and this sort of rubbery, you know, like a used condom flapping on one shoulder. <laughs> Uh, and I said, but Alan, it doesn't have to be realistic. We, we don't know, for example, the, the, the text does not state how large Zaphod's head is, or indeed where on it, his body it grows. And it could be, you know, up his bottom, for all we know. Uh, but anyway, he went ahead, and so it was a slightly uncomfortable and un unhappy experience for me, actually. And if you look at the credits of the television series, you'll see when my name, name comes up as associate producer, it is shot off into the <laughs> outer reaches of the galaxy, because that's how much Alan liked me. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry about opening old wounds there, John. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. sharing My that. name's John, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dirk, um, I'd like to talk to you about the radio series. Um, I can remember hearing it for the first time, and the thing that struck me, of course, was the, the sound. It didn't sound like a radio series. It sounded, as I think Douglas may have pointed out, um, it sounded like Dark Side of the Moon. It sounded like one of those that really worked on progressive albums. And um, I think you're known for making audio movies. You, you've taken on that mantle. But how did you come involved with it in the first place, and what, what struck you about it? I just joined the BBC in... Um uh, July uh, 1978 as a trainee studio manager and Hitchhiker had obviously just gone out and was almost immediately being repeated and it was on everyone's lips as being the, the new big thing in, in technology because it was so... Uh, they, they were sending stuff off to Radiophonic Workshop and then they were getting it back and then editing it into this wonderful series. And we were all told that we had to listen to this. And I listened to it, and I absolutely ab own up immediately. I just thought, I listened to, I think, the first episode. I thought, oh, Doctor Who with jokes. <laughs> and I walked away. I was, oh, yeah, all right, OK, fine. And I kind of missed where it began to grow into this thing um, until I was on night shifts as a studio manager. We went to Bush House uh, for the world service and we did night shifts and setting in the newsroom on a quiet night when no one's invading anyone else. <laughs> You've got a lot of time on your hands and they were, they had all this sort of bookcase full of reels of tape, some of which were bloopers, some of which were this, and there was the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, series one, it, although at that time it was, it, nobody knew there was going to be more than one series, no one outside of Light's End. Um, so I listened to it and I suddenly got what was going on and I realised that this was just pushing the boundaries in the way that no, I mean it wasn't round the horn, that's for sure. Um, and and that was that was the thing, it was an eye opener for me as a and as, as an SM and as someone who who I was actually intending to go to television. I was I couldn't wait to leave radio. And that was going to shake the dust of radio from my feet, go and work in television. I want I wanted to do what John did without the, the tedious but necessary business of learning how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, uh, this was, you know, this was a bit of an eye opener, and I think in a way it sort of the curse was then on me because I realised what radio could do, and then in turn I eventually became a radio light entertainment producer. And that's when I heard all the inside stories about it, that it was the first stereo production by the department, yeah. and that apparently um, Con Mahoney, I can't remember who was actually head of the department at the time, uh, played it back, and he'd only got one speaker of his stereo wired in. <laughs> so he then asked Douglas and Simon Brett, who produced the pilot, uh, where all the other voices were, because all he heard was one side of the conversation. <laughs> um, so you hear all the other stories about 
how things can go wrong. But uh, no, it was groundbreaking, it was inspiring, and I, I, at the time, I never in a million years thought I'd ever get to work on Hitchhikers, because it was gone by the time I was in there. Um, but I think it had that lasting effect on me, absolutely. So how did you get to work on it? I mean, what was that process? Uh, I, 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 I was trying stuff out. I was doing the usual boilerplate comedy shows like the News Headlines, uh, on which I, thank you, sir, on which I learned everything I know about comedy and timing and writing and, and uh, editing scripts. Um, uh, if you've got to put a, um, I mean, John knows this, but if you have to put a live show on once a week in front of an audience and turn it around in, in eight hours flat and put it out on the air, that's a heck of a good way to learn the, the business of editing. Um, but I was also doing other things, and one of the program ideas that got me into light entertainment, because one of your tasks was to offer them something, and if they liked it and bought it, you had a better chance of getting a job there, was uh, putting Superman on trial for his 50th anniversary. And in doing so, I was going to write it, and Neil Cargill was going to produce it, because you couldn't write and produce, God forbid, you get a big <laughs> head. Um, and um, Neil, uh, Neil did a fine job, but, um, uh, but I, we did this Superman uh, because it was his 50th anniversary. And I had the idea of writing it like it was a film. And that was the moment that sort of I thought, hang on a minute, I don't need pictures to tell this story. And that drew, uh, that drew me into other comic book related projects. It got me into a relationship with DC Comics, which has lasted, thank God, to this day, because I'm currently working on a job with them. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the big upshot of it was that Douglas heard one of these productions, uh, rang my boss, Jonathan James Moore, uh, who was then head of Light End, and said, um, if, we brought, if, if, if you were to adapt these, the, the last three novels of Hitchhikers to radio, do you think this chap, Dirk, would be interested in doing it? Well, I was banging on the door of 22 Duncan Terrace <laughs> before Douglas had put the phone down. <laughs> Holy smoke. Um, and, um, and I still pinched myself, because I really don't believe it happened, but it did happen. And I had an, an interesting insight into Douglas, really, because <clears throat> he was, we, we, we had a, I think I was there for two hours the first day. We talked about hitchhikers for 10 minutes, and then for one hour and 50 minutes, we talked about drums and guitars. <laughs> that kind of was how it worked. Procrastination, I think. <laughs> I'd say con creative um, distraction. Therapy. distraction yeah. <laughs> so after hearing what, uh, what John was saying, I was wondering whether, do you think if, if Douglas had had a, a writing partner that he would have been much more prolific and turned out a lot of stuff, that it was he, working on his own that actually stopped him being more prolific? Um. Uh, anything would have helped. He hated writing. Basically, he he never um, he never went into this to be a to, to be a screenwriter. Uh, sorry, to be a to, to be a novelist. Um, he wanted to basically to write his material, and he wanted to be out there and, and perform it. Um, and in which case, he never would be on his own. He would always be basically as a script, a gag, uh, as part of a team. So, when you look at uh, when he was at the university, uh, Adam Smith Adams, uh, I and mean, we used to get. I didn't see basically any of the performance uh, being performed. All we used to see was these bizarre posters that would appear in the house of Douglas in a chicken outfit on, on Brentwood <laughs> Station or, or what have you. Um, absolutely loving it. Um, and churning out all this material, these gags, and some of which we, we, we went back and looked at again um, for the, uh, the Apollo, his 60th birthday, of actually some of this material. Um, but it's only, yes, the fact that, 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 that the radio became the radio, which was so successful that it came into the book, which as marvelously picked up with Mark's um, play earlier, that to turn the first book was actually really easy because he'd already written it um, as, a, a, as a radio series. Um, so going on, but basically, yes, he, him sat alone somewhere uh, writing was, was never a good idea. Uh, not at all. So when you did, when you did work with him, John, did he take well to suggestions, to notes, to collaboration, or, or was he reluctant to take notes? No, no, he was great. I mean, we, so it was just baffling to me why he would put himself through the misery of, I'm a team guy, you know, I, I know that I don't do anything, I just 
good at picking people, so as a producer. And so when you find somebody, you get on with that well. We shared exactly the same sense of humor. We were both really interested in science and technology. We'd read all the science fiction books, and we were friends. It was, why would you not want that? But anyway, you wanted to do The Lonely Road, and then that's, that's fine. It's very unusual, actually, for comedy to be written by one person. It's nearly always teams, you know. Um, you know, Muir and Norton and Gordon and Simpson and J Jones and Palin and Gleason and Chapman. It's, it's absolutely common because of that thing that what you need is a nutcase with all the ideas and somebody to tidy it up. That, that's, it's classic, so. Um, but I'd never resented it because although it was a shock at the time, it. It's, it was a kick I needed. I, I uh, was saying to somebody in the queue of the bookshop, that book we wrote, The Meaning of Lift, together. I know people who've had that book since 1983, and in, in meetings they sometimes say, have you ever read a book called The Meaning of Lift? <laughs> and I go, yeah, I, I kind of wrote it. <laughs> and they pull it out of their pocket, just like this, and they go, oh my God! <laughs> There's a name under Douglas's, that's weird. <laughs> So, um, and I, I, you know, I spent a, 45 years as a producer. I don't mind being a relatively behind the scenes person. I like Dirk, I'm very happy to help other people do it well and not to take the, the obvious credit. But it's like, so you're talking about the, writing the book, James. So we booked this holiday in the Corfu, the wrong bit of Corfu, the northwest corner where n nobody well, they still they go there now, but it was like basically a beach covered in seaweed, a church and a taverna and two little houses on the hill and, and a lot of dust everywhere. And we booked this holiday and then Douglas sacked me in the interim, but of course I couldn't afford two holidays a year. I'd already spent the money, so we went together. And in the mornings I would eventually get up and go down to Taverna Manthos. He's still alive, he's 80-something now, this bonkers Greek. Uh, on the beach, and Douglas would sit. You could see him from the taverna up on the hill in, this, in the veranda with his big writer's hat on, enormous BBC typewriter that he'd stolen from the office, <laughs> tapping away, and you could hear the people you know, cursing and going, Ugh, and you hear the clunk of things in the waste paper basket. And eventually, about 11.15, you'd see him look at his watch, and he'd slope down to the taverna. We'd open a bottle of Retsina, and that, that was how the first novel came to be written. <laughs> and he had to throw it away at the end of the month because it was actually Kurt Vonnegut novel. Uh, he hadn't found his own style yet. It wasn't that easy to turn the scripts into, into a novel. Anyway, he used to play this game uh, when we were down on the taverna on the beach, which his, his uh, old English teacher had taught him, which is you have to say, what's an Epping? You know, what's a, um, what's a Heckman White? What's an, what's an Ely? That kind of thing. And out of that came eventually the meaning of lift. So, that month wasn't wasted, but it was wasted on Hitchhike. He started all over again when he got back to, to London and then eventually found his feet. So it was, you know, it was fantastic fun working with Douglas. I mean, I enjoyed it. I wouldn't have fired him. If I find somebody that good, you cling to them, you know, as much as you can. But it's my lot in life, Dick. I've been fired by Rowan Atkinson eight times now, so. <laughs> <laughs> well record, thank you. Um, you, you touched on the fact that um, sci-fi and comedy is not, is, is, it's not common, it's rare. And Kurt Vonnegut, maybe, who was a satirist, brought satire to, uh, to sci-fi. Perhaps only Robert Sheckley was as someone that was writing out-and-out -out comedy sci-fi. And Dirk, you had to take on the mantle, you had to um, work with the words on the Hitchhikers. How did you find it? And um, and what did you a take? A poison that? chalice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still recovering. Well, you know, all, there's all this history of hitchhikers, and I come in this enthusiastic baby light end producer and realize I'm walking into a minefield. And it happened quite early on, actually. And I was thinking of this as, as John was speaking, because actually, I think one of the things about Douglas was he, he kind of was like an oyster. In, in order to make a pearl, he needed a bit of grit. And I think that John was that bit of grit at one point. Uh, and it didn't have to be, I mean, and I think John was a positive piece of grit. I think there were negative pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Stay with me, I'm not sure where I'm going. <laughs> um, but, um, 
um, this immediately, the, the, the initial effort to, to, to bring about the tertiary phase was in 1992-93. And I had rung Peter Jones, he was aboard. I'd rung Simon Jones, he was aboard. Uh, Sue Sheridan I was bumping into in the sound house, and she was definitely aboard. I mean, everybody was up for it. But as soon as you start, this is the thing about hitchhikers, it attracts, it doesn't just attract lovely people as are in this room now, he carefully <laughs> said. It also attracts all the sort of, <laughs> all the sort of kind of, you know, any, everybody's in it to see what they can make out of it, which is kind of, which would bring us onto the tour uh, earlier this decade, but let's not go there. Um, but the thing that happened there was suddenly everybody in management was really interested in how it was going to turn out. And there was this enormous meeting of people about who was going to write the script. And at the point where Douglas and I were talking, that hadn't been decided yet. And I'd thrown my hat into the ring quite early. And I said, look, I could, I could do a script and then you could read it. And if you like it and you think it's OK, you can stick your name on it as long as somebody pays me. I'm fine about that, but you know, if it if it helps to have it all under one roof. But in the end, some agent or another introduced a, a very very charming writer into the mix called Alec Rowe, who was absolutely lovely. And Alec generated a first script for Tertiary, into which he inserted a talking dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in my office in uh, 16 Langham Street where Light Entertainment was based at the time, and this script came in in the brown miller envelope, and I got it out, and I got to page three, and I thought, I'm not sure this is where this is supposed to go at all. And I had a courier take it round to Douglas's, and I think, th I, I didn't hear the explosion, but <laughs> I'm assuming outdoors it was, it was audible uh, by Selfridges, because uh, uh, Jonathan got a phone call no, I got a phone call from Douglas saying, Can you, are you able to come around now? And the tone of his voice suggested that I really ought to. <laughs> and I did, and I went in, and Jane showed me in and said, he's downstairs, sort of just with this cursory gesture. So I went downstairs to the basement front room at uh, Duncan Terrace, and there was Douglas on his MacBook or whatever the equivalent was then, banging away furiously. And there was this sort of driven quality that you've kind of suggested. <coughs> But he was absolutely focused like laser beam. And he said, I can't write this bloody book all over again. I can't write this bloody book all over again. And I said, was it the dinosaur? He said, of course it was the fucking dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read it? And I said, well, I read enough to know that I thought that might be a problem. <laughs> And he sort of, he, he got about five pages in or whatever it was, and he stopped, he, he closed the lid of the machine. He said, I, I can't do this. We, you, know, this is a, we, you know, this is a problem. Um, and I said, okay, well, you know, my office's still there, but, you know, do what you feel you have to do. Because I, I, I was happy. You see, I, John makes a very important point. There are people like John and I who basically are the tidier uppers and the, the, the sort of make it fit the format without killing the, the spontaneity, without killing the initial spark, you have to actually shape things to go out there in order for them to succeed. And you have to have a sort of ordered mind, I think, is, is probably right. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's an important uh, not to like talking dinosaurs too much. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. have, a, have an inkling that your writer might be a, a bit pissed off. Um, so I kind of went back to the office, and that was the Talking Dinosaur was where the 1993 production of Tertiary didn't happen, because we could have made it 10 years before we did if this thing hadn't happened. I'm not saying I came in and saved it, but in the end, I was allowed to do the adaptation, and what I did was try and make it as Douglasy, if that's a, sorry, terrible adjective, uh, as possible. I just tried to channel him. And I'm not in his league in any sense, not in terms of IQ, not in terms of comedy, um, uh, nous, certainly not in terms of altitude. But, uh, but I do, I, I was in the room with him when he was doing this and it impressed upon me how important it was that it had to reflect what he was trying to do in the books. And I think by the time he wrote Life, the Universe, and everything, yes, it was an adapted Doctor Who script. Yes, it had elements of other things in. But 
he had found his voice as an author by then, and it's very much a hitchhiker book. And so that led me into doing the, the other two series uh, from the, the third, fourth, and fifth were, were based on Douglas's books. And by the time I got to the fifth series, I felt we needed closure, so I, I tried to bring the Vogons back in a little earlier in the curve than he had and so on, because I had the advantage of hindsight. When he was writing it, he was inventing on the hoof. Um, and I think that uh, it, it, trying to put on Douglas's writing shoes uh, if that's that's a terrible analogy. <laughs> anyway, uh, you, you're on a you're on a hiding to nothing, but all I could do was try and channel him as best I could, and um, and it's been an immense honour. But I'm also very relieved to step back from it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, another couple of Douglas's interests that seems to me inform the Hitchhiker's work is his interest in the future and computers and where science is going. But he also is interested in ec ecology yeah. and where the planet's going. I mean, w was he always like that, or is this something he developed en route? Uh, no, there's something he very much developed en route. Um, I mean, he took the very early decision um, in, in his education that he would basically went down the art side. He went to Cambridge and studied English. Um, if he'd had his time again, it would have been completely um, the other way. But it's, uh, I mean, a lot of that, the interest, computers basically was an easy one because... If you sit in front of a typewriter and you have to write, there's really not a lot else that the typewriter is going to do for you, apart from sit there, hence the bars. Uh, suddenly, basically, word processors turned up. Uh, and this was a brilliant notion because you could sit in front of it and you could be gainfully employed doing something with this machine. Now, it wasn't what he was being paid to do. Um, <laughs> that was utterly irrelevant, but basically that, that he could... And suddenly this opened up then the door that he could talk to these other people around the world. Um, basically, you know, he had an email address when most people didn't have a clue what a computer was. Um, and, and I think it was just this fascination of this world and, and, and how things um, got to work. And very early on, in the, um, one of his other great distraction therapy was the Digital Village. Uh, when they had this brilliant idea that everyone else, oh, I knew where my towel is, it's on the floor. Um, <laughs> Uh, in in uh, the digital village, basically, the, the, they were all going to make their, their dot-com fortunes. Um, and at a very early, early on, he, he kind of realised that this, this dot-com fortune idea was fantastic. Um, none of them could work out where the money was coming from. But that didn't seem to put anyone else off, so it didn't put them off. And they absolutely... And one of the guys that he was involved in, that is a chap called Richard, Richard Harris, who, um, if every, any of you uh, sit and watch basically television on demand... Um, that is an idea that Richard Harris came out with. Um, and nobody would listen to him, so he quietly just went and did it and then sold them the company to them for millions and millions and millions, and now they listen to him. But he, uh, he basically, evolution was what he studied and suddenly realised that, that actually evolution and computers, he went in it from the whole evolution side, um, but computers are fascinating and you can actually then turn the, the, the two upside down and use what they all learned about evolution um, to basically fuel uh, basic computing, which absolutely fascinated Douglas. And then he met Richard Dawkins, um, and that was it. But it, suddenly that the spark in his, in his life sort of, you know, completely cemented. Uh, but I think, you know, had he had his time again, um, and had he gone down that road, I think he would, he would still have achieved great things. I think in the world of AI or what have you today, he would, you know, he would have been an absolute trailblazer. Um, how he would have got the comedy element into it, I have no idea. Um, mm. Well, and he's interested in endangered species and trying to save the planet that way. Was that caught up in that? In that no, that was distraction therapy as well. <laughs> that, uh, he, he basically was sat there, you know, having to work and do stuff, and the Observer magazine phoned him up and said, hey, we'd like to send you on an all-expenses-paid trip to Madagascar. Uh, with Mark Carl who nobody knew at the time, who basically then was a very respected zoologist. Uh, and we want you to basically rummage around on this, this tropical island looking for eye eyes. Um, he wasn't going to say no to that. Um, but it was a great uh, byproduct because I, oh, I think in many ways it's the best written of all Douglas's books. It's, it is his, uh, it's his favourite. I mean, he always said that basically, you know, what was his favourite creation? It was, um, it was Last oh, Chance to See. Yeah. Um, and... It's, yeah, I mean, that then opened the doors and basically so everything that his fascination um, 
and it basically just tied in because the evolution, um, animals, and a lot of it was just the futility, the utter futility that, that, that surely everyone can see what we're doing to all these creatures. I can see it, you can see it. Uh, Mark, who basically always said that um, he didn't kind of know why he spent all those years studying zoology um, to become one of the world's, and he has just written the, uh, the absolute definitive Bible uh, on, on whales and dolphins. Um, that, uh, and he basically said that, you know, you, you get to that point in life that you, you, you know absolutely everything, you know what we're doing, and yet it takes somebody like Douglas, who knows absolutely nothing about the subject matter. Uh, Mark always said he thought that Douglas had done more for conservation than any other single person that he, he, that he knew of. Um, and that was, you know, 30 odd years ago, and it is still, um, you know, it is still going out there, the last chance to see it. It's still got mileage, there's still people who look at it, study, who, who, who read it. Um, and it's just where Douglas, Douglas always had this fascination that you could go to, um, in fact, it was bloody annoying, actually. You could, <laughs> you could, go, you could go with him to watch a, a play, or you go to a concert, or you go to him with something, and he'd be sat there, and you'd be sat here, and you'd be all watching the same show. And then in the car on the way home, you would discuss what you'd seen to realize that I watched it from being here, you watched it from being here, and he watched it from being sat up in a corner of the room. <laughs> and he saw something that none of the rest of us did. Um, and the reason it was really annoying is because you think, well, why didn't you tell me <laughs> that you were going to be sat up there because the show that you saw was a damn sight better than the one that we all saw. <laughs> and that was his whole thing on life. You kind of got the feeling that, yes, we were all living this life and we were all going through the same thing, and yet he saw everything from a completely different aspect. That, that's absolutely true. Right from when I first met him, he was doing Footlights. He used to hold these things called smokers, which were kind of auditioned for the proper show. And sort of students used to turn up and you had to write your own stuff. And I remember Douglas coming on, this amazingly tall bloke, um, and doing this monologue about a tree that went on for about 20 minutes. And people were just looking at the notes in their program going, no idea. No. <laughs> because, you know, it took the rest of the world time to catch up, really. Because he always had such a weird take on things that if you didn't know him, I mean, now, you know, the... The, the corpus of work is so amazing, it's just iconic and it's a text and almost like holy writ. But when he started, he was so odd that it took a really unusual person to get what he was doing, you know. I mean, you know, he'd do this, uh, I used to produce a show called Weekending, which is a topical, you know, political comedy, went out very late at night on Fridays. And uh, Douglas got a little commission to write it and of course it was all about well, the sort of things that are in Hitchhike. He said, no, Douglas, this is about the news. <laughs> I'd think a bit dull if it's about the news. <laughs> but that, that's the brief of the program. Oh, OK. So it, I was going to say another interesting thing about meeting Richard Dawkins, which is I think it was, it, you know, it became one of his passions, atheism, um, Douglas. And... I thought it slightly got in the way of stuff because the one thing you want as a writer is not to be certain about things, I think. If you, if you start getting certainties, which he was so certain that Richard was right. I mean, Richard's actually now backtracked a bit. He said he's only 99.9% .9 certain <laughs> because it's not scientific. If you're, if you're absolutely sure, if, it, you, if you're 100% certain, that's not science. But if there's some doubt, it's okay. But I found that um, there were sort of areas that you couldn't talk to about with Douglas towards the end of his life before he would get on a bit of a podium and talk about it. The good side of that was conservation, which was always fascinating and passionate. And the, diff the other thing was like, you know, there's no meaning, there's no point, there's no, uh, no nothing. It's kind of like, it doesn't feel like that to me, Douglas, but uh, it never, never did to him either. I thought it was not, not a healthy position, personally, but... It's, it's funny, having adapted the last three books, for someone who is a professed atheist, how many references to God <laughs> and gods there are in it. And the, and the, and the sort of, and with, um, this, I'm not ascribing anything to Douglas or anyone else, but it's just very interesting. There's a sort of theistic culture. But this is the thing, that atheists are much more interested in God than the rest of us. Most of us, <laughs> don't, most of us don't go you know, three weeks without thinking about it. But, uh, no, there's no such thing. Well, yeah. 
It used to be one of his highlights, actually, at Christmas down in Dorset. He used to love going to Midnight, Ma Midnight Mass. Any excuse to go to church, and that was a simple thing because he loved the choral music, um, the music side of it. But, uh, yeah. And his prescience of, you know, like uh, with hitchhikers, sort of almost uh, pre-guessing the internet, and then with, um, with Last Chance to See, um, pre-guessing the current interest in conservation. And I think that's one of the things that keeps his work alive, isn't it? And makes it seem so vital today and keeps it fresh. And I don't think that was something he planned, was it? That was just a byproduct. It's really interesting that the, the thing about Hitchhiker is it is one of those things that will stand forever because it was Douglas's own truth, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Especially those first two books, I think, and the radio series. There's something about them that will stand forever. And, you know, I know kids, you know, 14-year-olds today who read those first two books as if they've just been printed and they just... It doesn't seem set in time. I read them, it seems like it seems a book written in the 70s to me, but kids don't feel like that. You've said that to me, you've said, hasn't it dated? We were talking about something and you, we were talking about it and you felt it, it, it sounded as if it, 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 it was of its era and yet... It was me who dated, not the books. That was <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wouldn't go there. As you said. No, I wouldn't go there, John. But, um, but what's interesting is that you, so many people discover it when they're between 12 and 14. And, and uh, when we did the tours, um, uh, and it was wonderful because a lot of people brought their kids. And it's the kids who are falling about laughing. And the kids could not know that Simon and Jeff were the original Ford and Arthur or anything like this. They were just laughing at the material. And, and this was the, the high point for me, and this is a story I've told many times, but I'll tell it quickly again, was when Douglas's mum came with Jane to the Southampton show. And we met in the foyer beforehand, and of course everybody's in dressing gowns and towels, and they've got their kids in the same. And Jan, Douglas's mum, said to me, she said, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to like this. And I said, oh, oh what's wrong? And she said, well, it's all a bit like a cult, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, but it, it, well, it, yeah, it kind of, but actually in the most inoffensive, nice way, really. And Jane said, don't worry, I'll text you if we leave. <laughs> so, fine. So we do this show, and I was selfishly playing drums in the band and helping with the sound effects because I wasn't going to miss it for anything because it really was enormous fun. And at halftime, we go backstage, grab a glass of water, look at the texts, and the first one says, Mum, Mum is, is enjoying the band. She says, Douglas would have liked this. I thought, oh, good. And the second one is, Mum is laughing at the jokes. And the third one is, Mum is on her feet clapping. <laughs> so, well, there's a fighting chance Mum might still be here at the end of the evening. And indeed, she was. And we met at the pub down the road from the, the Mayflower. And, um, and she came up to me and she slapped me on both cheeks quite hard. And I thought, <laughs> ah, obviously, Act Two is, needs some work. Um, uh, but she, uh, and she said, um, when my husband and I, your dad, um, used to go to bed and hear it, we would fall asleep because it was quite late at night and we didn't really understand it. <laughs> but I've, now I've seen it with all these people in the room laughing, I realise how funny Douglas was. <laughs> and that was a wonderful moment because she hadn't known just that Douglas's stuff made people laugh the way it did. And that made the whole thing worthwhile for I mean, that, that That trip to the... the um to the show. I think that was kind of almost the defining moment of her when she did realise that it was funny. Because yeah, um, really. up to that point, uh, Hitchhikers basically, the birth of Hitchhikers in the house, she would just be sat there making peanut butter sandwiches um, <laughs> and farming them up and never knowing if it was a good, you know, was it a good time to knock on his door and was it not a good time. Um, and it's quite funny, just before coming here earlier today, I was going through some stuff and there was a letter from Alan Jane and Bell to Douglas basically saying at the end of the series, uh, Basically saying, here, here are two awards. Obviously, Douglas wasn't around to pick it up. Uh, I understand a lot of the cast and people you know, are upset there's not going to be another series. But the way that he hints, even in that letter, that he's still at that point not sure if it's funny. Mm. Um, yeah. and that, so to Mum, basically, the whole thing, it, was, it wasn't a pleasant process. of Hitchhikers yeah. being born and all the forms that it came through. Uh, and then when Douglas, uh, Ed Victor, who famously went and sold the rights to, to one of his books for, for, for millions, and which upset everyone in the publishing world, because what you did as an agent is you went to the publisher of the last book and said, my dear fellow, would you like to publish the next book? Same fee, rounded up a bit. 
Ed basically threw it out the window and went out into the marketplace and said, uh, Douglas Adams is going to write a book, how much money are you going to give? And it was something like £2.2 .2 million. Pounds. Now, Douglas made a really, really, really profoundly stupid mistake, and he divided the number of words that he was going to deliver <laughs> by 2.2 .2 million quid. So any of you who saw, basically, the, 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 Mark, the, uh, the play earlier today, that was his notion, that he would go upstairs, he'd be in Duncan Terrace, and, uh, and Sue Freestone, who was his editor, and she, but before they got to the point when he was locked in hotel rooms, she would sit in his, in, in his kitchen, and he'd be in his study on the top floor, and uh, he would so like, sit up there, and he'd go typing and typing and typing and typing, and he'd come down by sort of 10 o'clock in the morning coffee, and he'd have a 1,000 words, and Sue would sit there thinking, thank you, God, this is brilliant. And off he'd go upstairs, and he'd come down at lunchtime, and he'd proffer these pages in front of her, and she couldn't help but notice, but it was significantly less words than was on the pages when he'd come down at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And she thinks, well, don't say anything, don't say anything, because obviously he's got, a, he's got this as a plan. And then he'd disappear. By the end of the day, he would have got those 1,000 words down to 150. <laughs> um, but as far as he was concerned, they were 150 words worthy of what he was being paid um, for those 150 words. What really pissed him off at the time is that Stephen Fry, who was another distraction therapy, uh, not in that way, um, <laughs> who, uh, who lived around the corner, and they used to argue amongst themselves as to who bought the first Apple Mac in the UK uh, <laughs> and who bought the second. Uh, Stephen was absolutely convinced. He gave in that Douglas, I'll let you buy basically the first one, Douglas, as long as we can tell the world that I bought the second one. Unfortunately, at that point, Douglas came out with a receipt for two Apple Macs. <laughs> uh, so Stephen had the bit that, okay, he bought the third one. Uh, but he would sit there wanting to go upstairs and play. Um, basically play on computers, play, do anything. And Sue used to say, look, I'm really, really sorry, Stephen, but until he comes down with a decent body of work, it's not happening. And over this period, the pair of them, basically, Sue was saying to Stephen, do you know what, you could do this. And he said, well, I could do what? He said, you could, you could write a book. You could sort of, oh, I couldn't write a book. Honestly, she said, you could write a book. You write a book, and I will edit it for him. And he didn't say anything about it, but he disappeared for three weeks and came back with the hippopotamus. Uh, of which then Douglas, Douglas and Stephen had an awful lot of fallings out, and I think that was the first one that basically realised that how easy he found it was to go and do it. Uh, whereas Douglas would just be sat there with this, yeah, this constant, constant block as to how to actually get it out of him. Well, thank you so much. I do think now that I have a, a much clearer image of Douglas in my mind, uh, hearing from you three guys. Thanks ever so much. And uh, thank you all for coming. And, and it's great, as I say, to have it here in the British Library. It's a, it's fitting uh, to, a tribute place to have it, his work in. And also, um, it's, it's great to be on stage with three positive grits. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>